Hello to everyone. Welcome to the course on numerical linear algebra and application. Today we are going to have 20th lecture of this course. Before going to the next contents of this lecture, let us quickly recall what we did in the last lecture. In fact, in the last lecture, we were doing Gauss elimination with partial pivoting, Gauss elimination with complete pivoting and what is the stability of these systems. If you do have a right hand side vector, how the solution would be affected and how you could able to draw the best approximation. Today, we are going to have a very realistic case solving a linear system with multiple right hand sides. That means you will have more than one right side vector. Let us consider the system Ax is equal to B, where B is B1, B2, B3, Bm is an n by n matrix assuming that m is less than or equal to n and x is equal to x1, x2, x3, xm, m rows, n columns. Here b i and x i, i is equal to 1, 2, etc. m are n vectors. Problem of this type arise in many practical applications. When you go to the control systems, when you go to the computational fluid dynamics, when you go to the image processing, when you go to the seismic wave dynamics, etc., you do find these kind of models. The idea will be to factorize A with one right side head vector at one go and then use this factorization to solve all the subsequent triangular systems. Thus, if P of A is equal to L into U, thus if P of A is equal to L into U, then AX is equal to B is equivalent to two triangular systems, each having M equations. Thus, if P A is equal to L U, then A X is equal to B is equivalent to two triangular systems having M equations. So, you write it as L of Z will be equivalent to P times of B, which I call it as B prime. U of X is equal to Z. Now I will set z is equal to z1, z2, z of m. b prime is equal to b1 prime, b2 prime, bm prime. Right? So, Lz is equal to Pb that is B prime and Ux is equal to Z where Z is equal to Z1, Z2, Z3, Zm and B prime is equal to B1 prime, B2 prime, B3 prime, Bm prime. The algorithm is as follows. Solving Ax is equal to B linear system with 
multiple right hand sides using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. Input is you will have matrix A n over n and matrix B n over m. Input is A belongs to R of M n, A belongs to R of n over n and B is R of n m. Output is a vector x belongs to R of n m such that a x is equal to b. Step 1 factorize a using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. Factorize A using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. So that means you will have PA is equal to LU. So P times of A is equal to L into U. P times of A is equal to L into U. Step 2 is solve the M lower triangular systems. Solve the M lower triangular systems LZI is equal to P into BI which will be equivalent to BI prime. Solve the M lower triangular systems LZI is equal to PBI which is equal to BI prime. In step 3, Solve them upper triangular systems uxi uxi is equal to z of i i is equal to 1 2 etc m solve them upper triangular systems u of xi is equal to zi i is equal to 1 2 etc m step 4 is form x is equal to x1 x2 x3 xm and the flop count is the above algorithm requires approximately 2 times of n cube by 3 plus mn square so you require 2 times of n cube by 3 plus m n square. So, we can do one example that is you have a system A x is equal to b and as spoken this is the one column this is the another column. So, two right side vectors. So, anyway the matrix A is 3 over 3, 3 rows and 3 columns and B is 3 rows, 1 column. Now apply the Gaussian elimination for this matrix A that is partial pivoting. So R2 minus 4 times of R1. R3 minus 7 times of R1. So you get 0 over here, you get 0 over here. Then it is 6 by 7 minus 4 into 8. Right? So that is 5 minus 4 into So, you get what you call this is the main diagonal and these are all zeros and these are all non-zeros. So, essentially you will be getting what you call upper triangular matrix.
and using the multipliers using the multipliers m32 etc you can form the what we call lower triangular matrix the way which we did it earlier this is the lower triangular matrix and this is the upper triangular matrix so you get a matrix u comma l and p is the permutation matrix so initially when you use this upper triangular matrix so this is a bigger element so you brought it as a here right and then it will become 7 8 9 4 5 6 1 2 4 and this is anyway bigger element so when you do that you get multipliers so therefore the 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 so this is shifted over here 0 0 1 and then it is shifted over here 1 0 0 0 0 1 0 1 0 so you will have a permutation matrix you will have a lower triangular matrix you will have a upper triangular matrix now by just by using the algorithm step 2 solve the two lower triangular matrices so what is this is l of z1 is equal to b1 prime which implies z of 1 is equal to 5 2 over 7 0 and l of z2 is equal to b2 prime z2 implies z2 is equal to 6 8 by 7 0 L of Z1 is equal to B1, which implies Z1 is equal to 5 by 2, 2 by 7, 0. L of Z2 is equal to B2 prime, Z2 is equal to this thing. So, Z1 is known, 2 by 7, 0. Z2 is 6. 8 by 7, 0. Solve the two upper triangular systems. Ux1 is equal to Z1, which implies X1 you would be getting one solution as 1 over 3, 1 over 3, 0. X2 another solution as minus 2 over 3, 4 over 3, 0. X1 as 1 over 3, 1 over 3, 0. X2 as minus 2 over 3, 4 by 3, 0. So that means essentially you are getting X1 and you are getting X2. So you will have AX is equal to B. So this B is having a multiple right hand side vector B1, comma B2. So you will be getting X as X1 x2 now finally i am forming x1 x2 the vectors b1 prime b2 prime b3 prime brm prime are obtained just by reshuffling the columns of matrix b according to the permutation of indices P, no matrix multiplication is necessary, very important. So once again let me repeat, the vectors B1 prime, B2 prime, Bm prime are obtained just by reshuffling the columns of matrix B according to the permutation indices of matrix P, no matrix multiplication is necessary. That is the speciality of the cause and elimination with partial pivoting whenever you do have more than one right side vectors. Occasionally you also 
need to do scaling. If you don't do the scaling, the solution may have, may blow up. So therefore, this strategy is very useful in order to get the best approximation. If the entries of a matrix A are widely varying, then there is a possibility that a very small number, very small number needed to be added to a very large number during the process of elimination. This can influence the accuracy greatly because the big one can kill the small one. To circumvent this difficulty, often it is suggested that the rows or matrix A be properly scaled before the elimination process begins. The following simple example illustrates this. So, for example, if you have an element 10 power 4 and 1, 1, minus 1, let us say that. So, these three values are, absolute values are 1, mod of minus 1 is 1. So, this is a very weaker value. So, you need to do the scaling. If you do not do the scaling, the solution may blow up. So, therefore, scaling is necessary. We will see one example how it is necessary. Look at this. Consider the system 10, 10 power 6, 1, 1. So, you are multiplying with A, X, this is B. A, X, B. So, A is 10, 1, 10 power 6, 1 and X is x1, x2 and b is 10 power 6 comma 2. Now apply Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. Since 10 is the largest entry in the first column, no interchange is needed. We have after the first step of elimination, which gives x2 is equal to 1, x1 is equal to 0, the exact solution, however, is 1 comma 1. This happened because 10 was indeed a false pivot. So, if right pivot is not being chosen, then it is a very cumbersome to trace it out. So, therefore, 10 was indeed a false pivot. Note that if the first equation is multiplied by let us say 10 power minus 6. So, what would happen? So, it becomes, so this is 10 power minus 6. So, 10 power minus 5, 1, 1, 1. Therefore, even choosing the false pivot, 10 did not help us. However, if the scale system is now solved, after modifying the first entry of B appropriately using partial pivoting, we will then have the accurate solution as we have seen before. So, therefore, the example enables us, we need to do the scaling. Scaling of the rows of A is equivalent to finding an invertible diagonal matrix D1. So that the largest element in magnitude in each row of D1 inverse of A. In each row of D inverse of A is about the same size once such D is found, this is D, once such D is found, D1, this is the solution of the system 
x is equal to b is found by solving the scaled system, not sealed, scaled system. A cap x is equal to b cap that is still a, I mean new matrix where a cap is nothing but d1 inverse of times of a, b tilde is nothing but d1 inverse of b, a tilde is d1 inverse of a and b tilde is d1 inverse of b. So, we can conclude some remarks over here. Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is a computationally effective practical scheme for solving modest size arbitrarily linear system problems. It is stable in practice and also efficient algorithm. Gaussian elimination without pivoting should not be used unless matrix A is symmetric positive definite or strictly diagonally dominant. Scaling is recommended prior to the use of Gaussian elimination if the entries of matrix A vary widely. How actually the inverses could be computed and how determinant could be computed for factor, factorization of the matrices. Associated with the problem of solving the linear system Ax is equal to B or the problem of finding the determinant and inverse of matrix A, we will also see how the determinant, how the determinant and the inverse can be computed using LU factorization. Avoiding explicit competition of the inverses. The inverse of a matrix A very seldom needs to be computed explicitly. Most computational problems involving inverses can be reformulated in terms of solution of linear systems. For example, computing A inverse of B is equivalent to solving a system Ax is equal to B. That means A inverse of B is equal to X. So, A B is equal to Ax or Ax is equal to B. A inverse of B gives is equivalent to solving the system A C i is equal to B i, i is equal to 1 to etc. m if B is equal to B 1, B 2, B 3, B m. B transpose A inverse of C vector times inverse A vector is equivalent to solving the system Ax is equal to C followed by computing B transpose of X. Computing the inverse of an arbitrary non-singular matrix. If A is an n by n non-singular matrix, then finding A inverse is equivalent to computing Ax such that Ax is equal to I. X is equal to A inverse of I. Thus, if x is equal to x1, x2, x3, xn and x is nothing but x1, x2, xn and i is nothing but e1, e2, en, then a x is equal to i is equivalent to solving n linear systems. Axi is equal to Ei, i is equal to 1 to n. If partial pivoting is used to solve these n systems, then we have the following algorithm to compute A inverse. So, this is the algorithm we have it. Input is the matrix A, R of n over n. Output is A inverse, we need to compute it. What is the step one is using the previous algorithm solve n linear systems A x i is equal to B i. B i. Step two is form A inverse is equal to 
x1, x2, x3. That means essentially this you do have a x i is equal to b i. So there is an error not e b i. It is equivalent to one to compute a inverse directly from the LU factorization. That means P A is equal to L into U. So, implies A inverse is equal to U inverse L inverse L inverse into P multiplied with P. So, what is the flop count in this case? In this case, the flop count is A and 8, 10 Q by 3 flops are needed to compute A inverse using this algorithm. Now, let us see how this algorithm will apply to particular example. So, you will have a 3 rows, 3 columns. A is equal to 1, 2, 4, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now, by step 1, if you use Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting, so this is the matrix you are getting, upper triangular matrix, and multipliers will give you the lower triangular matrix, and this is the permutation matrix. By using matrices L, U, and P, so we can obtain L, Z, I is equal to P, E1. So, you get Z1 as this. So, LZ2 is equal to PE2. So, you get the Z2. That means LZ3 is equal to PE3. You get like this. So, essentially UX2, UX3 you get it. Then A inverse is nothing but X1, X2, X3. This is the A inverse. By using direct calculation as we spoke in the previous case. That is PA will become U inverse, L inverse, P. Thus, we obtained the what you call inverse of this matrix. Right? This is the inverse of matrix where the determinant of this is not equal to 0. And if you compute A into A inverse, you get I. Now, the next is how to compute the determinant of a matrix. The determinant of a matrix A is seldom needed in practice. However, if it has to be computed, LU factorization of A again can be used. If Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is used, so you will have a PA is equal to LU. Then determinant of A will be equivalent to determinant of P time delta of determinant of L multiplied determinant of U. Determinant of L is 1, determinant of U is equal to A11, A22, updated value, etc. and you get the determinant like this. So, what is R? R is the number of interchanges, how we will be interchanging each time. If you look at this example, 3 rows, 3 columns, and Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting, see here or here, you are getting this alpha triangle matrix. There was only one interchange, therefore, R is equal to 1, determinant of A is nothing but minus 1 into determinant of U. So, minus 1 into minus 1, which is equal to 1. So, that is how you would be getting very quickly. Here, we discuss the role of the condition number in the accuracy of the solution. Once a solution X of the system AX is equal to B has been computed, it is natural to test how accurate the computed solution X tilde is. If the exact solution is X is known, then one could of course compute the relative error that is norm of X minus X cap divided by norm of X. To test the accuracy of x cap. However, in most practical situations, the exact solution is unknown. So that is an that is unknown. In such cases, the most obvious thing to do is to compute the residual R is equal to B minus AX cap and see how small the relative residue is that is that is divided by norm of b so interestingly we should not we should note that the solution obtained by the gaussian elimination process in general 
produces a small residue. Unfortunately, a small relative residual does not guarantee the accuracy of the solution. You can see the following example. Look at this. This is the value and B is this. X cap is this. Then if you compute R is equal to B minus X, you get like this. R is small. Number of times you do interchange. However, the vector X is nowhere close to the exact solution. So that means X cap you are getting 0, 2, which you are actually supposed to get x1, x2 as 1, 1. Nowhere close to that. So, the residue theorem, what it says is, the norm of x square minus x upon norm of a relative x is less than or equal to condition number of a times of norm of r, norm of b. So, the system will become ill-conditioned because if the pivot is very small or a large computed solution or a large residual vectors. Now you look at this example, Ax is equal to B. So this is a matrix you have got it and B is a right hand vector. So if you use the method and solve the solution, you get like this. The value is quite large, 10 power 4 is large, 10 power 4 is large. So therefore, if you take the A inverse, then 10 power 5 times of this thing, which is large. Thus, for this example, the computer solution large because an A inverse is large. A is therefore likely to be ill-conditioned system. And of course, by using the condition number of A as we already spoke, it is 10 power 5. So it is true that it becomes a ill-conditioned system. So scaling in general recommended if the entries of the matrix A vary widely. Scaling followed by a strategy of pivot is very helpful. We noted that the scaling has an effect on the condition number of the matrix. If you take this example 10, 10 power 6, 1, 1, what is the condition number? Very large. However, if the first row is scaled, then the condition number turns out to be 0. So that means condition number 2 is a stable, condition number 10 power 6 is unstable. So condition the C, the scaling will help us how you get the condition, the, Ill, con, the well conditioned system. So therefore, from this article what we learned is, if you do the scaling, it is highly possible that you will have a stable system because the condition number also going to be small. And if you not scale it, the condition number becomes bigger, thereby you get ill condition system where we will not be able to get the best approximation. So I am sure that you today you have learned it, how you could solve the system Ax is equal to B when we have a multiple right hand side vector, determinants, scaling and associated examples, how the scaling will help us in order to find the best approximate solution. So thank you very much for listening to my class today. And thank you very much once again.